I am going to be talking about the, some of the science of firearm violence. Um, I'm a practicing emergency physician in the level one trauma center, and that's what made me a scientist. I was interested in preventing some of the things that um, brought patients into the emergency room, looking at extreme and the flow of events that brought people to the emergency department, and I have been in more ways than one, swimming upstream on this issue for more than 30 years now. Um, I, the other, two other things that you should know. One is, um, because I'm a clinician, I'm of a practical bent, I'm interested not just in doing the science for the sake of the science, but to make the world a better place. I work with journalists all the time, all the time. Um, just really smart ones, the ones who are just here for the day, and, and you can tell the difference. Um, but I really enjoy working with journalists, and I would enjoy contacts um, from any of you. Um, the other thing that I should mention right up front is, uh, as Bruce uh, kind of alluded to, there was um, a little bit of controversy about the funding of this conference. It receives some of its funding from an organization that does advocacy, and I do not take uh, funding directly or indirectly from advocacy groups. You should know that I'm here on my own network. Um, so, with uh, the other thing I should mention right now uh, is that uh, I'm going to move through material that I've brought uh, at an indecent rate of speed because uh, I'm really interested in the interactive Q&A part of this that will come at the end. Um, it will come before you expect it. It's not going to come. It's going to come during the talk. Um, I think part of the fun of being a scientist, part of the fun of being a journalist, and we're all investigators, right, um, is in questioning established wisdom. Uh, and uh, it, it gets me up a little bit earlier in the morning, and that's going to be part of the day. And we're going to go through uh, criticism of a very widely cited study that, in my judgment, was reported on uncritically. And um, I was afraid of that study in print. I should get, place my bias space up. Um, and we're going to go through an exercise together. And this is going to be interactive. If somebody is tweeting, I'm going to walk over and say, you get to address the following question. <laughs> so, so if you want to tweet now, you can, you can tweet now, um, except that Bruce told you not. But when we get to the, to the interactive part of your tweeting, you, you are up for grabs. <laughs> um, so having, having said all of that, we all are used to thinking of, uh, or getting used to thinking of firearm violence as a public health problem. And that's an understanding that is actually of quite recent origin. And just over 20 years ago, when it was a hard case to make, you know, people had not been thinking about it in, in that way, um, the, the then head of the Centers for Disease Control, who had just become head of the Centers for Disease Control, was interviewed in the New York Times about the nature of his job and interviewed about violence and the other issues that he talked about. And um, tried, to, tried to make the case that violence was a public health problem, and said one of the best uh, gave one of the best reasons I think that has been uh, been offered. He said simply, if it isn't a public health problem, then why are all these people dying from it? And simple enough. So um, I'm going to be approaching violence as a public health problem. We're going to look at some epidemiologic data. I believe that you have. Uh, or at least have access to a paper that we published just uh, a couple of months ago that has in it many of the uh, slides that you're about to see, so take detailed notes if you want, but um, I think you have the paper if you don't, I'm happy to, to send it to you. Um, beyond the epidemiology, we are going to talk a little bit about policy. I was asked to talk about the science, so there's not as much policy as I, as I would ordinarily put, and I love policy. So um, ask policy questions. I do um, a lot of policy work. Um, I mentioned the critique, and I'm going to close with a slide. Um, please understand that it was not a prescriptive slide. Um, it's um, some suggestions. The last slide is going to be uh, a list of what I think are some of the big stories that are coming, um, areas you might want to focus. If they're, if they're, I guess I'll put it this way. If you see something on that last slide that's already of interest to you, I'm, I'm telling you, yeah, go for it, because there's going to be a lot of attention on the page. So with that, um, before we move further, what I'd like to do um, is just talk about all those people um, that the head of uh, CDC mentioned. The basic numbers. 
Um, in the most recent 10 years for which we have data, we've lost more than uh, 300,000 civilians in the United States to firearm suicide and homicide. For the sake of this talk, I'm going to be using the term firearm violence to refer to suicide and homicide. I'm, I'm not going to be talking um, about unintentional shootings that are relatively uncommon. Um, we can certainly talk about it during the Q&A. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the deaths of undetermined origin and so on. About 30,000 deaths a year, um, uh, more than nearly, rather, 70% of all homicides in the United States are committed with firearms. More than half, and it's now an increasing majority of suicides in the United States are committed with firearms. Um, and, the, and the costs uh, were estimated in 2010 <coughs> to be what I think most of us would consider real money, the kind of money that you can express um, as a percentage of GDP. If it's okay with you, I'm going to hold questions. Real ahead. quickly, though, this is updated data. So, I, so I just, just want to make say, sure. Yep. Okay. So uh, Mother Jones and ProPublica um, have actually the same economist, Ted Miller, who um, generated this estimate, collaborated with Mother Jones on a revision, which was published earlier this month. Um, and this number is, um, at, over the span of the ensuing five years, this number is now 223. Um, a, a nice coincidence with a, a popular rifle caliber. Um, but by now, some of you may be wondering, why does the guy have Arlington in the background? Um, we've just marked Memorial Day. As, a, as an epidemiologist, there are jokes about this, as an epidemiologist, uh, I am, we are, I'm always looking for comparisons, some sort of way to ground really kind of abstract numbers like this. Um, in a context that will speak to a, a more general um, readership. We, we, both, we all of this in, in the room um, face the challenge of how to get what we've just learned that nobody else knows out in a way that people will not only read it, but they'll remember it um, and be energized for it, by it. And I was looking for comparisons and came up um, with the following. In the last 10 years, we have lost um, more civilians to firearm violence than the United States had combat fatalities, all mechanisms of injury put together in World War II. We have lost in the last 10 years more civilians to firearm violence than the United States has experienced in all other conflicts, not including World War II, all other conflicts in its history, from the revolution to the current uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Arlington has more than 400,000 graves. We have been burying people in Arlington for 151 years. We could fill a parallel Arlington with civilians in somewhere between 12 and 13 years. OK, I'm going to digress for a moment. We can come back to this in Q&A. A couple of comments on mass shootings. This is Aurora. Uh, and. Um, mental illness. Mass shootings were the lead news story in 2012. They outpaced the election, let alone anything else that happened. They have, I, we were talking before um, the meeting, things are different since Sandy Hook, and indeed things are, offices like this are, are happening and they are well attended, um, and nobody's tweeting. Um, but it's, um, there are times when as for you folks, there are times when, as a researcher, somebody who's guided by the evidence, um, you need to personally come to realizations and publicize realizations that run contrary to the public's understanding um, in ways that are sometimes painful for the person making the disclosure, painful for the, uh, uh, the people in the period. And there are a couple of those here. Mass shootings are not the problem. Mass shootings are the most easily described portion of the problem, and that theme has been mentioned a couple of times already. But look at it this way. Take Columbine and Virginia Tech and Aurora and Tucson, where Gabby Giffords was shot just down the road, and Sandy Hook. All together, 90 people died other than the shooters. And I'm not minimizing those 90 deaths or the tragedies that continue to unfold um, among their survivors. But we lose, on average, 89 people every day, on average, day in and day out. A very small percentage of the problem you all are here to talk about is represented by these sorts of events. 
The and no two of these events are alike. The policy implication is we cannot base policy on events like these. If we do, we won't prevent the next such event because they're all different. And we won't be doing much about the far larger share of the problem that several of you mentioned. Point number two, mental illness. There is, there is, I think, a very strong and, and increasingly strong perception among the public that crazy people are behind firearm violence. And that is just not true. When it comes to interpersonal violence, one person against another, less than 4% of cases are attributable primarily to mental illness. And I'm going to come back to this theme in a minute. Mental illness plays a huge role in firearm violence, just not in the way we think it does. And I'll come back to that point. OK, um, you have these. Um, and if not, I, as I said, I will send them to you. Um, so we're going to look at some of the data. Um, I'm going to uh, offer in, there will be a lot of comparisons here. Um, that's the, the point. Um, as you all know, I, I used to give this as kind of a quiz talk that uh, over time everybody had the answers. Firearm violence is predominantly a suicide problem. It was predominantly a suicide problem even back in the period of time between the uh, mid-1980s and about 2000 when rates of firearm homicide were far higher than they had been uh, before or after. Um, nope. What's happening here over the last now close to 10 years? Note this divergence. Rates of firearm homicide have been, on balance, I think, slowly declining. We would fit a negative, a, a downward sloping line to that. Where rates of firearm suicide have been going steadily up. I'm going to come back to that point several times um, before we're done. Um, I should mention um, one of the first papers I ever wrote 35 years ago now, um, almost, uh, when I was a punk. Um, looked at this sort of this same sort of comparison for the 20th century, and this was true going back all the way to the 1930s, with very rare exceptions. Firearm, firearm, fatal firearm violence is not predominantly a crime problem. It is primarily a self-directed violence problem. It was the fact that the crime part was dealt with by criminologists, and the suicide part was dealt with by mental health experts, and the Unintentional shootings uh, part was dealt with by safety experts and hunters and whatnot. It was the fact that there were these three seemingly separate problems dealt with by separate groups of people that in fact had a common denominator, the technology, that led to the first efforts to portray firearm injury and death as a public health problem to be human. Let's look in a little bit more detail. We've shifted from us uh, uh, to 2012. I just haven't had time to update all the slides as new data have, uh, have come out. We are looking here at death rates from firearm homicide only for males in the year 2012 by age, by race slash ethnicity, and we are looking at deaths per 100,000 people. This is a risk-based graph. This is the image of firearm violence that most people have. You are familiar with this graph even if you've never seen it. This is the graph that says firearm violence is predominantly a problem of young African American men. And if we are talking about homicide, that's true. In fact, you have to look hard. I, I have not looked hard enough. I have not found one, not for lack of effort. You have to look harder than I have looked so far in order to find a, a, a major medical or public health problem for which risk, risk is so concentrated um, as it is, as is firearm homicide among young African American men. Now, let's go directly to a policy implication. Um, let's take the phrase, Black Lives Matter. That phrase has the peculiar resonance that it does in this culture, because all of us know that for many of us, that's not true. And we have to admit that, whether it's true among ourselves or not, we have to admit it's true about our society, that not all lives matter equally. And I bring that uncomfortable point up because it is a daily part of trying to do something with these data at the policy level that one recognizes, I am talking to people who consider themselves policymakers, 
people who consider themselves not to have a stake in the issue because it affects people who are not like me. Now, don't take my word for that. I'm going to read you a quote. This quote comes from a man named Jeff Cooper. Jeff is dead now. Um, he lived to a very old age. Um, Jeff was a Marine. He was one of the um, architects of modern combat handgun tactics um, and uh, was uh, an official of the National Rifle Association. In his retirement from the military and other things, he ran a ranch that taught people how to use firearms under combat conditions in Nevada. That ranch, the Gunsight Ranch, still exists. I told it's a very fascinating place to visit. Um, it's not even that here. Um, and Jeff Cooper had this to say about this phenomenon. He said it back here when that epidemic was in full swing. I'm quoting directly. The consensus is that no more than five to 10 people in 100 who die by gunfire in Los Angeles, who's talking about Los Angeles, are any loss to society. These people fight small wars amongst themselves. It would seem a valid social service to keep them well supplied with ammunition. That quote appeared in his column uh, in Guns and Ammo. He was a thought leader in a particular aspect of the gun culture in the United States. Gun culture for this country is a misnomer. There are all kinds of different subjects. I, I, it's, um, I don't use the term gun culture just like I don't use the term gun control. They are both misleading, overly simplistic, overly general. So, homicide. But look now at suicide. Same general display. Suicide, males, 2012. Death rates by age. The picture is completely different. Homicide, suicide. In the case of suicide, rates for white males are risk for white males is highest beginning at the first age uh, at which risk is measured. There are suicides among five to nine year olds in the United States. Um, the differential increases, and then it just keeps on increasing. The, incre the age-related increase in risk in firearm suicide among uh, white men is greatest as they get older. Now, I'm going to aggregate homicide and suicide. So now we're talking about firearm violence. Um, but let me go back a couple of slides. Watch the resemblances. So this red line looks very much like the red slide two, uh, red line two slides. Hence, this um, most firearm deaths among black males are homicides. Most firearm deaths among white males are suicides. Not going to get all the way into that. But my point here is this. As we aggregate, what you see is essentially a homicide curve here with a relatively smaller number of suicides thrown in. And what you see here is essentially a suicide curve with a relatively speaking smaller number of homicides. So if I can alternate again, this line right here pretty much is this line right here. It's just that it's been squished down toward the horizontal by the far larger risk um, that exists among um, African-American males. Everybody's with me to this point, right? OK, now I'm going to mix it up some. Up until this slide, I have been taking a risk-based approach to the problem. And there's much to be said for a risk-based approach to problems like this. The group at highest risk potentially has the most to benefit from things that you might do about the problem. So it is traditional in public health to start with identifying the high-risk groups and then uh, potentially to focus our interventions on them. But there is a complementary approach to problems like this. It's not contradictory. It is complementary. They work really well together. This approach is called the population health approach as opposed to the public health approach. The population health approach stems from this observation that the greatest number of adverse health events, I don't care what we're talking about, actually heart attacks are the, the prime example. The greatest number of adverse health events can occur among members, of, uh, among members of the population who are at low risk, not high risk, if the low risk group is big enough. Most heart attacks occur among people who don't have a boatload of risk factors for heart disease. 
because there's so many such people. Everybody has that, right? Okay. This is risk. The approach I just talked about, um, in place of risk, substitutes what's called burden, the burden of illness. Where are the most cases? So I'm gonna, the next slide is going to show you these exact same events. The only thing that's going to change is, whoops, <coughs> I'm going to take a razor. The only thing that's going to change is I'm going to get rid of the denominator. And instead of talking about rates, we're just going to talk about number of cases. So risk, burden. There are a lot of white males in the United States such that they're relatively speaking low risk for firearm violence predominantly suicide um, leads to the picture you see here. So burden, risk, same events, risk, burden. I can do this all day. Um, so the red line carries over. Um, risk is high, it's a small group, but risk is so high, it still shows up when you look at burden as, as an obvious peak. But it's, the, the visual message here is obvious. By the time you hit age 35, how many people have not yet hit age 35? Good. I will. Um, so incidentally, I meant to say what I really like about this group is um, there's some old people in the room, and I can say that sitting on the oldest person in the room. Um, and there are some people just getting started, and that's perfect. And um, sorry I'm not going to be here tomorrow because that kind of interchange is a lot of fun. But in any case, by the time you hit um, age 35, most deaths from firearm violence in the United States occur among, uh, among males um, in the United States, occur among white males. By the time you hit age 60, an age I last saw quite some time ago, um, more than 90% of deaths from firearm violence in the United States occur among, white, from, among males, occur among white males. They're suicides, they're not homicides. Now, two more points to make about that. One is, this problem, I, I, the slide is in the paper, I didn't put it in for sake of time. Homicide rates um, among young African American males, this peak right here, if you will, this kind of 30 year age then, have increased in the last roughly 10 years by about 5%. We'd like to see a, a decrease, but the increase is about 5%. The rate of suicide among white males ages 35 to 64 in the last 10 years has gone up by 30%. This is the edge of the wave right here. The other observation to make is this is where mental illness shows up. I mentioned that about 4% of interpersonal violence is primarily attributable to mental illness. For suicide, the estimates range from between 45% and 75%, directly attributable to mental illness. But it's not psychosis. It's not the voices are telling me to kill myself. It's depression, which is much more common than we think it is. And there is a whole body of literature um, to buttress the statements I just made. One other point. The question comes up, what are we going to do about this? If anything, we could adopt the Jeff Cooper approach. All we have, it's really simple, actually. Um, all you have to do is change a preposition. And we could say, these people fight small wars within themselves. Um, we could add, for this group over here, if we felt like it, and besides they're going to get old, they are old, they're going to get sick soon, and their being sick is going to cost us a lot of money, so why are we intervening? Um, and we could conclude with it would seem about with social service to keep them well supplied with ammunition. Um, I'm going to argue that that's not the approach we're going to take here, and I would argue that that's not the approach we should be taking over here either. Um, although, to some extent, I think we still do um, take that approach. Okay. End of discussion about science. We're going to move into the science of policy, because I can't resist. Um, what I want to talk about uh, is a couple of the main risk factors for firearm violence. The ones I'm going to talk about, other than agent sets, which we've kind of talked about already, and race ethnicity, um, are uh, alcohol abuse, um, not time to talk about controlled substances. Um, we're going to talk about alcohol, and we're going to talk about a prior history of criminal activity, in particular a prior history of violent criminal activity, because there are some good data. Before we do that, I want to talk to you about a policy issue that's been mentioned already, and I'm going to mention it again, um, that uh, comes into play here. 
A couple of mentions were made of um, polarization. And there is polarization on, on this issue. Um, it is not between the NRA and other people. Um, and where, where that has most clearly been established is on the question of comprehensive background checks. Um, if you ask people, do you support gun control? People tend to say, no, I say no to that, because I don't know what it means. I need to talk about that. But if you ask people about specific policies, level of support goes up quite, quite dramatically. So for example, for comprehensive background checks, support is somewhere between 85 and 92-ish percent of the general population. It's above 80 percent for firearm owners. It's above 70 percent for members of the National Rifle Association. The divide is not between so much between uh, people who own guns and people who don't. It's between the leaderships of organizations that have one sort or another of a vested interest vested interest in maintaining an appearance of polarization when in fact no, no such uh, reality exists. Sorry, that was a digression. Um, the reason I brought up Jack on Chess at this point, um, apart from that there is an advancing story, is there is widespread agreement that people at really high risk for uh, committing firearm violence should not be allowed to have access to firearms. There are legitimate differences in opinion over what constitutes sufficiently high risk, but the devil is in the details. Background checks make enforcing such policies possible. It's just this simple. You can't enforce a policy that says a person who's at really high risk of imminent violence with a firearm can't buy a gun. You can't enforce that policy if, at the moment of purchase, you don't know who the members of those high risk groups are. And that, frankly, is all the background checks do. They, they provide a mechanism for ensuring that as I'm about to sell this gentleman the gun, I, I can, in one way or another, know whether he's prohibited or not. A very nice tie notwithstanding. He tells me he is. A mole. <laughs> all right. Um, these risk factors, by the way, prior violence, alcohol abuse, controlled substance abuse, um, apply to the mentally ill as they do to the rest of us. And that's another polarization um, that I think uh, is, uh, does not serve us well. So well, let's move on. Let's talk about prior violence first. I got to move fast. Um, <coughs> so this is work that we did um, in California, looking at the question, are, is a history of prior criminal activity a risk factor for future, future criminal activity among people who legally purchase handguns in California, where we have data that allows us to do this? The comparison will be here to people who bought guns but had no prior criminal record. In California, it's possible to administratively enroll, if you will, large populations of people who purchased handguns, you know the exact date on which that purchase occurred, um, look at criminal records before and after, and, and uh, come up with answers to these questions. So let me lay out this slide a little bit. In, in this study, I should mention there are about 4,000 handgun purchasers in the study. We followed them for 15 years after they purchased their firearms. Um, in characterizing their prior history, we look just at convictions. By the way, um, there are no felons in this study because these people bought their handguns legally, and if you're a felon, you can't buy a handgun legally. So we looked at prior misdemeanor convictions, and these categories here were assigned um, hierarchically. So if you were eligible for this one, that's the one that you were in. So people who had prior convictions for some kind of misdemeanor that involved neither firearms nor violence one of them or two of them. Prior convictions involving firearms, but not violence, illegal carrying, one or two. Prior convictions involving, fi involving violence, whether firearms were involved or not. Um, and across looking at outcomes over 15 years, we looked at something called relative risk. I'm gonna assume that not everybody here is comfortable with what a relative risk is. When I say relative risk, you, you think times as likely as. It's not percent, it's, it's a factor of. So when, for example, and, and actually I'll come back, I'll finish off the definition of what to say. We looked at relative risk of arrest for various kinds of crimes. Violent crime index crimes, that's a term of art, murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault. So when I say that compared to people with no prior criminal record, those legal handgun purchasers who had only one prior conviction and that for an offense um, involving neither firearms nor violence had a relative risk of 5.9 for uh, arrest for any offense 
you think 5.9 times as likely as to be arrested for, et cetera. Got it? So what you can see here is that if we use convictions as, as our benchmark, there is no level of prior activity below which risk for future criminal activity is not significantly increased by a factor of basically five among people who purchase handguns legally. Is everybody with me? Yes? Okay. So um, I'm going to point out just a couple other things on this slide. Notice what we call the dose-response relationship. As you go from one conviction to two or more convictions, the risk ratio grows. Um, that's a, a very common finding um, in research like this and it lends plausibility to the results because it's consistent with what other research has shown about the, the general question, the general statement, the battery you were, the battery you were. So, so again, Gary, just yes. to be clear. Yes. The, so no the convictions without a gun and without violence, you're still five times more likely. Five times as likely. As likely. Right. Huh? Five times as likely. Yep. As uh, uh, to be arrested. To be arrested as someone <coughs> with no priors whatsoever. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. And then you move up from that. That's correct. Okay. So I'm just going to go down to the bottom here. People with prior violent misdemeanor convictions, two or more of them, among legal purchasers of handguns. Anywhere from roughly 10-ish to 15 times as likely as people with no prior criminal record um, to be arrested in the future. That is a big difference. All of these people bought those handguns legally through a licensed retailer. That's how we know about them. That's how we have records. In most of the country, all of these people still can buy handguns, other kinds of firearms, legally, because the laws have to change. California changed its law, and uh, not as a result of this research. The change in the law was made before this was done, um, but we had a natural experiment to, to evaluate, and we did. What California did was say, not having these data, but knowing is the way um, people do, this, uh, this is unacceptable. Um, California made it illegal to purchase handguns or possess handguns um, if you had a prior conviction for a violent misdemeanor. And here's what happened as a result. You're used to the setup on the slide. Uh, in this case, our referent group is people who had their purchases denied. I'll back up in just a second and, and do the backstory. And we're looking again at relative risk of arrest among violent misdemeanors. Here's the setup. The state changes its policy. We take two groups of people. Everybody in both groups has a violent misdemeanor conviction, at least one. Everybody in both groups tries to buy a handgun. Group one, old policy, purchase approved. Group two, new policy, purchase denied. The groups were, frankly, eerily similar in demographics and everything else. The only difference between these two groups of people is gun yes, gun no. And here's what we found. You know what a relative risk is? Um, we looked at relative risk for uh, crimes involving firearms or violence. And again, we were comparing <coughs> the people whose purchases were approved, who were, if you will, exposed to a handgun purchase, um, and our, if you will, unexposed group are the people whose purchases were denied. So that exposure was associated with a 30% increase in uh, risk of arrest for uh, 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 crime involving firearms or violence. Uh, at age 21 to 24, when the absolute rates of arrest were highest, you don't have that here, but take my word for it, and it, and it uh, is concordant with your experience. Risk was increased, risk associated with a handgun purchase increased by 40%, blah, blah, blah. Here's a group for which we saw no effect. People with three or more prior misdemeanor convictions uh, for, for offenses involving firearms or violence. Denial of purchase was not associated with benefit in that group. I'm not actually surprised by that. I didn't predict it, but I'm not surprised. These, I suspect, are people, three or more prior convictions, Lord knows how many offenses. These are people with an established pattern of behavior that involves the sorts of activity that lead to things like this. 
These, I, this is speculation from the results, but I think it's plausible. These are the people who don't change that pattern of behavior. These are the people who, if they are denied a handgun from a licensed retailer, will find some other way to get a gun because they've got a, a, a pattern of behavior to maintain. But this was a very small group. And the overall effect is here. I could turn this upside down and say that risk among those who were denied was about 70% of risk among those whose purchases were approved. And frankly, if I had it to do over again, I would have, I would have done the analysis that way. But you stick with, you, 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 uh, you stick with what you started with. Um, so, so a small group, overall effect. When I'm talking to policymakers about this stuff, I say, OK, so it didn't work for that high risk group of continuing offenders. That's what we have cops for, and what we have other approaches to violence prevention for. There will be no single approach to violence prevention that will prevent all violence. I, I continue to hear people say, let's just get rid of all the guns, um, and, and everything will be fine. And, and my response, which I only verbalized when we got around in the second like this is, what have you been smoking? It is just not going to happen. OK, alcohol. Um, I should mention at this point, by the way, um, we are releasing a study basically today. Um, it's a, a pretty lengthy review article. I think you're about to see here is in that article on the relationship relationship between alcohol misuse and risk for firearm violence. Um, there are press releases. Kate has copies, and yeah. I have copies. Oh, they're just right at the edge they're of the desk. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, <coughs> what I'm going to do is. Uh, is there a resource table outside? There yeah. is. Yeah. So we'll just add these to the resource table. If you're interested, um, you can you can grab um, a press release. In any case, so let's talk about alcohol. Um, first off, what do we drink in the United States? 30-day um, history of alcohol use, uh, uh, information obtained by government surveyors. So I'm willing to say to a representative of the federal government, I'm willing to provide information about my alcohol behaviors. In a given month, more than half the population drinks some. 17% binge drinks. That's five or more drinks in a single setting for men, four or more drinks in a single uh, setting for women. That's not sexism, that's body weight. Um, 6% um, drink heavily on a chronic basis, two or more daily for men, one or more daily for women. So lots of exposure to alcohol. Second bullet point, lots of exposure to firearms. There are maybe 50 million, 60 million. Um, I, I use numbers like this, and Phil Coke, who we're going to hear from next, is really good at crit, 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 criticizing them. So I don't know if you're going to criticize this one or not. But um, the general social survey, which gathers information on a, uh, on a regular basis, asks the same question over and over again. Uh, is there a gun in your home? And if there is, do you own it? Um, this is an estimate um, from their data. Don't worry about the number. The point is this there are a lot of firearm, firearm owners in the United States, and there are a lot of people who drink in the United States. And you'll remember uh, Venn diagrams. If, if two exposures are really common, the overlap between those exposures is likely to be common too. Um, and indeed, it, <coughs> excuse me, it is. Um, a study was done, I'll uh, talk about that study in just a second. As a result of the study, um, best estimate is this, if we assume that firearm owners drink alcohol um, and do these other sorts of things um, no more commonly than the general population does. Um, it's just a matter of back of the envelope math to estimate that in a given month, something like 9 million firearm owners binge drink at least once, something like 2.5 million firearm owners drink heavily on a chronic basis in, in any given month. But there's a range here. Um, and the reason for the range is this. Um, our group went back to um, data from uh, a CDC survey project called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, not from 2010. They had to use data from the mid-90s because that's the last time CDC had the guts to ask these questions. Um, after adjusting for age, race, sex, and state of residence, firearm owners are not just more likely to drink, they are substantially more likely to binge drink and to drink heavily on a chronic basis than are people who don't have firearms at home. And the high range of the estimates come from applying uh, those data from BRFSS. So if you believe the high range, close on 12 million uh, gun owners binge drinking in a given month, 3.5 million drinking heavily on a chronic basis. 
Okay, so let's assume for the sake of the argument that there are a lot of firearm owners who drink out there. Um, doesn't matter. Um, it matters, first off, in this way, just to um, look at the uh, size of the problem. This again is in that uh, new um, paper that's out today. Um, we used, again, some data from CDC from its alcohol-related disease impact uh, service to compare alcohol-attributable deaths from motor vehicle crashes and various kinds of violence over these four years. And that, it's an interactive website. You can do this, too. Um, and what we see, I'll just focus on the results for males, that based on the, the best data available for estimating, I actually tried to derive estimates a couple other ways and came up with essentially exactly the same answer. Um, there are, among men at least, as many alcohol-associated deaths from firearm violence as there are from motor vehicle crashes. So where's, where's the math for firearm violence? Uh, people who remember that history of that. Okay, so it's common. What is there, what's the risk? We'll go back to the public health side of things. So some of you in the room will be comfortable with the difference between prevalence and risk. Prevalence simply refers to how common something is. So up here, we've got some information on how common is acute alcohol intoxication among various sorts of people who either do bad things or have bad things happen to them. So 37% of violent, violent felony perpetrators by their own report. Um, and by the way, these surveys are from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. They are done on inmates who are already in prison. There's no secondary gain in saying, I was drunk, reduce my sentence. Their sentence, uh, their serving, their sentence is already. Um, for people who die from firearm violence, we have autopsies, and we're not asking questions. Um, and so acute intoxication is very high. That's prevalence. We need to think again about risk. Here's risk. Maybe it's the case that 25 to 30% of the general population is drunk at any one time, or at night, let's say, when these things might be more likely to happen. And there's no risk. It's just in the general population, right? How many people are drunk in the room at the moment? <laughs> so, but here's risk. And you've already read to the end of the slide. And somehow, the, that slide got reformatted a little bit. Oh, well, in any case, we're back to relative risks. So the relative risk for perpetrating interpersonal violence goes up by a factor of 3 to 6, 300 to 600 percent. Um, associated with prior history of alcohol uh, misuse, victimization, kind of the same, um, kind of the same for um, suicide for pre-existing. Look at this. For um, the relative risk of committing suicide with a firearm associated with acute intoxication. And the way this is done is look at blood alcohols in a bunch of people who just shot and killed themselves, and look at blood alcohols in otherwise similar people who live nearby sort of at the same time as the thinking. Um, and risk is up by a factor of 75 to 85. That's a lot. That's just obscene. All right. Now, how much time do I have? About 15 minutes, but we'll have conversation, so you should. So I'm going to stop now. Yep. Because uh, okay. unless you have something entertaining to say about John. <coughs> <laughs> Here's the problem. This is where we were going to critique that study and stuff. It will take most of the 15 minutes. So um, I would rather hear from you guys. Um, and then why do you, why do you do that? And then if you if there's a couple minutes and you want to circle back, okay, you know, see see how it goes. Okay, fair enough. So uh, with junk science, actually, um, I don't know if you can see it, but that's a um, a picture of my copy of uh, uh, America's First Freedom. And if I recall correctly, both Phil and I are um, mentioned in this article, um, but Phil's mentioned more. Um, uh, but I was, I was going to use this uh, to launch a critique of a study, um, and I talked to you more. So I'm going to stop. Questions, comments? Please. Just uh, off the top, your focus in your presentation is on males. And is that simply because um, gun violence isn't a significant problem among females? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out a quick way to get to the slides. Um, the longer version that doesn't have the policy part presents the slides for women as well. Um, the rates of fatal firearm violence are far higher among men than they are among women. After adjusting for everything else, testosterone poisoning is a real phenomenon. 
Um, but the patterns tend to be the same. Um, the, the, the lines aren't smooth because there are fewer deaths. Uh, but homicide, uh, for homicide, African American women um, are at greatest risk. Um, in fact, there are some interesting interactions. Um, African American women are at such high risk for firearm homicide that their risk is greater than that of white men. For suicide, white women die from start to finish. But, but actually, um, but there isn't the sort of continuing up with age curve we saw for men. So in the California data, uh -huh. we're looking at a lot of comparisons between people who had guns um, or were denied guns, things like that. Uh -huh. Any, are there any data for people who actually don't even, I know given the data set you were working with, right. people who were, right. any data for people who choose not to have guns around at all? Got it. Um, everybody's hearing the questions, right? I don't need to repeat them, I'm assuming. Okay. So we didn't do that. Um, and the reason is this. It, it derives partly from the data we have and partly from the data we don't have. Um, we have good data on uh, people who purchase guns from a licensed retailer. We know that those people have guns. Um, we've talked for years about doing a study um, that might involve, let's say, um, using as our sampling frame licensed uh, drivers. Or in, in California, you don't do people with an ID because um, they're all in the same database. Um, and we could, we could do that, and we could even get fancy, and we could delete from a list of people taken from that data set the people who were in the gun data set. But we still have no assurance that the people left over don't have guns. Okay. Because, because the data for gun ownership in California uh, until the beginning of last year uh, were only for handguns. So we don't know about people that have rifles and shotguns. The, those purchases go through dealers. They, they generate background checks. There's just no archives yet. The archives started in 2014. So some years from now, maybe, maybe we can do that. But then there are all the, the really illegal, as in the criminal intent, the nominally illegal but no criminal intent purchases that go not to a licensed retailer. And we just don't have that information. So, so Mary, if I'm a local or regional reporter and I'm trying to evaluate whether a some policy proposal either by an agency or, or in the legislature or an existing law is capturing the right risk pool, through your lens, the question I should be asking is, is this capturing people who've committed multiple misdemeanor homicide, uh, multiple, multiple misdemeanor uh, violent acts of violence with or without violence. That would be the first question, one of the first questions I might ask. That, so I was, was going to seize on first. There's, there's no top for any of this. You all know that. Um, that would be one of the questions. If the intent of the policy mm -hmm. is to prevent violent crime, Actually, I'll, I'll just mention about the study that we're not going to look at in detail. They kind of did this in a, you know, just a silly, oversimplified way. They took a, a list of 28 different laws that states had passed, and they ranked states by how many of these laws they had, beginning and end of, of assessment, basically. And they looked at rates of uh, death from firearm violence. With encouragement, they looked separately at suicide and homicide. They weren't going to do that. Um, and when they, when they did that, what they found was that having a bunch of these laws was associated, the laws were intended to prevent crime. All of the effect was on suicide. Hmm. And that wouldn't have been known except the reviewers wouldn't let the article go through without that addition. And just to, to the, other, the other piece of it um, is this. Something else they didn't do. All they did was say, how many laws do you have? What kind of death rates do you have? The other thing they didn't do originally was, uh, was include in the, the statistical modeling what, how common is gun ownership in, in your state. When, when they did that, when, when they were forced to do that, all of the effects that they saw went away. And 
They refused to talk about that fact in the published paper. So I know it was fine. Um, but in any case, you have to think about what's the intended effect of the law. You have to look for those effects. And then you have to look for all the unintended. I have several questions. First, so, let's start so hang on. Stop. You're going to get just one question because other hands went up. So you could, now there is a one. You get to pick one <laughs> question. And it cannot be a compound question. I will take the first half of the question. So I can't ask about this data? I, uh, I'll no, you can't. It offline. There, there, yes. I, I will give you my card. We right. will start a right. beautiful relationship. But other hands went up. And so one my, my question is then the research. I mean, how do you as a reporter, we, we are into data, and, and clearly because even even research becomes the focus of crit criticism that you did, that you didn't have the right approach or that you, you excluded certain data sets or certain people. How as a reporter, um, there has been a real movement by the NRA to keep say crime data for, uh, with, with guns that I was once able to access, now we can't, Congress won't let. So what recommendations for data sets would you as a reporter look for in order to find a holistic approach to the problem of guns or not having a problem of guns? Good. Um, so here are really good resources. Uh, we have good mortality data in the United States. And those mortality data are available for your use interactively in real time at CDC's Whiskers, W-I-S-Q-A-R-S, -S, Web-Based Interactive Statistical Query and Response System or something, but they have a cute little mountain lion quiggles uh, for Whiskers as you, um, as you look at the website. Um, the National Violent Death Reporting System uh, has very, very detailed data on uh, violent deaths in the states that participate. Many states do not participate. One more time, please. The name of that? National Violent Death Reporting System. It's available at the same website that, that brings you this same web page. Um, on the, and those are probably the two that we use the most often. Um, on the crime side, Uniform crime reporting data from the FBI. We have pretty good crime statistics. Um, ask Phil about this. They're, they're the best that we have, and they're about the best in the world, but they, they leave uh, a lot to be desired, particularly when it comes to studying firearm crime in particular. We have the National Crime Victimization Survey, another interactive website where you can do your own analyses. On the private side, I'm going to pick one and then stop. The General Social Survey. I mentioned that before. It's maintained by the University of Chicago. I mention it in part because the data are really good and carefully maintained, and in part because they also have an interactive website where you can do your own analysis. Their website is not user-friendly, and if you work for an organization that has data geeks employed to do that kind of stuff, this is the one time where you might need to help. The others you can do on your own. There are hands over here. So this is maybe a little bit more of a philosophical question, but um, I, I think a lot of news organizations, my, my own included, don't do a lot about suicide unless it's a public figure or a public place or um, someone else in the group of murder or suicide. We don't typically report on suicide. Um, so it's, it's kind of surprising to see how big of an issue gun suicides really are. And I was just kind of wondering how you, like, how you think reporters should do more about that. So think about it. The whole thing is right there. My organization doesn't report about it. Um, but I heard the audience reaction when I, when I put this up. Nobody's organization reports about it. Nobody knows about it. And potentially, if we had known about it some time back, we wouldn't today have the problem that we have. So I would argue, not just to you with the question, but to all of you as investigators, as bringers of the light and truth to people who don't have the ready access that you do, Suicide is a story to investigate. How do you go after it? I think a um, couple of possibilities. One is you can take an aggregate approach, and there, there, there are a lot of these deaths. Great books are easy to find. You can lead with local, with local data that you can get from your county medical examiner or coroner. You can interview those families if your organization allows you um, to do that kind of stuff. You can talk about the very large bigger picture of which uh, your anecdotes are a part. 
And you can talk about, isn't it interesting that we've ignored this problem? Mm -hmm. And as we've ignored it, it's been increasing year by year. What's wrong with all of us? So that, so that the inattention becomes part of the story. And parenthesis, um, the Guard Center actually did a workshop like this one on covering suicide a couple of years ago. And on our website, there are a lot of the resources generated by that workshop, including experts and tip sheets and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, just in general, how much or, or little is known, or is there a way to gauge a number of deaths by legally versus illegally fire, uh, obtained fire? <laughs> in, in general. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> so um, here's the problem. There's no. We don't have registry of firearms in this country. We don't have it in California. Um, we we used to have access to gun tracing data, guns used in a crime, local law enforcement. Uh, sends information to ATF and aggregated across hundreds of thousands of records, you could develop a picture of the operation of a criminal gun market because you could see where guns started and where they went. So, Cheryl, say something. You're, she, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. All right, and we'll put it in, in so, the parking lot. So, <laughs> some more talk. Are you going to talk about how we used to about T Hart and how we used to have the data and how we can? I've got, I've got, uh, so don't have to come tomorrow. Okay. And, and I'm putting up here, by the way, a parking lot for issues that we don't quite have time to talk about now, but that maybe at some point later today we will. Okay. Sir. Are you, are you familiar with John Mott's research and, and what, what do you think about it? Um, and the question was, am I familiar with John Mott's research and what do I think about it? Um, I'm familiar with his research. I know John Mott. We have, we have met a number of times. Um, Maybe, maybe quickly summarize it for people yeah. who don't yep. know. So, what, what would you say to journalists who are looking to use his research in if I could say, If I could say one thing yeah. to journalists who are looking to use his work, John Lott's major supporter is Ted Nugent. That's the one thing I would say. Um, people, a great deal of time and energy has been well spent pointing, uh, sort of like I would have done here, of pointing up the obvious, easy, fatal mistakes in John Locke's research. And the third thing I will say is John Locke uh, is one of a large number of people investigating violence in general, firearm violence in particular, and his conclusions are unique. <coughs> Nobody agrees with them. Think that. Okay, next. Uh, Sir. So I'll try and articulate my question as, um, as well as I can. You know, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the risk factors for, um, or I don't want to say risk factors, the criteria that we know makes someone or, or are associated with interpersonal gun violence. For example, if you have multiple convictions, you are probably more likely to use a gun that you've legally bought to commit an act of violence. Um, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we know um, a little less about, or the um, the kind of actionable risk factors for self-directed violence are maybe a little less clear. Um, you know, I was I was wondering, you know, what um, there are. You know, there have been some you know some movements in policy to kind of address that. I know, for example, in some states, if you've been committed to a mental institution, either voluntary, voluntarily or involuntarily, you can't legally own a firearm. Pennsylvania, I think, is one of those states. Um, I was wondering, what's the what's the current yeah. thinking on that? Right. Is there? So, a couple, couple of things. Um, one is, uh, on the crime side, mm -hmm. we have been willing to say that you, if you are a member of a high-risk group, mm -hmm. we're going to curtail things that you might otherwise be allowed to do. We are less willing to adopt that group approach when it comes to mental illness. Um, and I'm going to leave that uh, aside. It turns out that the main risk factors for uh, most of the main risk factors for interpersonal violence are also risk factors for self-directed violence. Sex, age, except it works differently. Old, old guys for self-directed, young guys for interpersonal. 
but um, where we come in, we can't do anything about that. Um, we do it for young people, but we're not going to say if you're over 65, you can't buy a gun. Um, <coughs> but alcohol. Um, I didn't talk about the policy implications because I wanted to do that critique. Um, but there are efforts um, to say if you have a bunch of prior misdemeanor convictions for offenses involving alcohol, you shouldn't be allowed to buy a gun. Uh, the article that we have coming up today is, is about that uh, potential issue. And alcohol applies equally to interpersonal and self-directed violence. So does controlled substance use. We have a law about that, but it's really quite an unenforceable law. Um, and then with regard to critical points in the history of mental illness, on the one hand, um, the statement I made about interpersonal violence uh, is true, small portion of the problem. It is also true that most people with serious mental illness never engage in violence. Those who do are likely to do so again. There are critical points in the history of mental illness that are associated with a very, very high short-term risk of violence in the future, one of which is a hospitalization. So in California, for example, uh, federal law does not do this. We do. If you are hospitalized involuntarily for dangerous to self, dangerousness to self or others on the basis of mental illness, you are prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms, period. That prohibition sunsets in five years. The policy recognizes that the conditions that led to the, the need for the prohibition may be temporary. So, and that, that is, um, that approach is becoming more common. The last thing I'll say about this is, and this, um, as a, I know this more as a clinician than as a researcher, there are all those people who are clear, something clearly is bad is going to happen with them, but there's no crime involved, and they're not um, holdable. Um, on, uh, they can't, we can't involuntarily admit that. I'll give you an example. Guy come, happens all the time. Guy comes in, he's really drunk. Um, he's lost things in his life lately. He's suicidal. And, and at 2 in the morning, we put a hold on him. At 8 in the morning, he's sober. He's got a headache, but he's not suicidal. And he's really not suicidal. And he is no longer holdable, and we lift the hold. And that can happen several times in a month. And the hold gets lifted every time, and then he kills himself. Well, there's a new mechanism in California that uh, has been enacted. It is the law. It won't take effect until uh, January. We are going to evaluate it. <coughs> It's called a gun violence restraining order. It is modeled very closely, consciously, very closely, on the domestic violence restraining order policies in California. For a guy like him, it, uh, it will allow, this, this new mechanism will allow either immediate family members or law enforcement, we'll hear the echoes with DV here uh, as I go, to go to a judge. There are rules of evidence, uh, information that the judge must consider, information that the judge may consider, but it's fairly specified in the bill. And they can petition for a gun violence restraining order. That risk is high. Um, we can't quantify how high, but we have a problem. And the judge is allowed to consider the evidence and basically say, look, I don't have all the answers, but I'm persuaded that risk is high here. Let's get the guns out of the equation and we figure it out. The order is only good for two weeks. It's renewable, like PD orders are. It can be extended for up to a year, etc. We don't know how this is going to operate. It hasn't, hasn't, um, hasn't started yet. Um, we don't know how often it's going to be used, etc. But we'll find out. Let's do one more question. Okay. Okay. In the back. Uh, I, I'm just uh, preface by saying that uh, methamphetamine is just, just ripping up uh, my community. They are my peeps. And, and, and uh, the California voters uh, recently decided to make methamphetamine possession a misdemeanor instead of a felony, which allows these people, and I have, I have law enforcement people tell me that the people that the people previously, previously convicted are saying, now I can get a gun. So right. I'm interested, I guess my question is, are you studying this and what the ramifications will be? Not yet, but we're going to. Um, so you're in Fresno, I'm in Sacramento. We, we have the, the same story. We are in methamphetamine capitals of the world. Um, crank is a really bad drug. I'd, I'd yeah, much rather people be on cocaine than crank. Kind of um, but the, the larger problem uh, is that we converted a bunch of um, prohibiting offenses into non-prohibiting offenses, not just for drugs. And um, 
some of those people are probably going to try uh, and have uh, the um, prohibition expunged and purchase guns, and, and we'll see. Um, there is, however, uh, a very quick uh, and widely supported effort uh, underway to um, not, I know I want to say one second to formulate the sentence, uh, not to um, say that those prior felonies uh, have to be felonies again, uh, but to extend the prohibited misdemeanors so that I can get my felony knocked down to a misdemeanor, but I'm still going to be prohibited. Because everybody sees the risk in a bunch of cranks or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll stop it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.